morning, church. Thanks for joining us uh, as we experiment in our first ever video uh, music worship session at Exit. Um, it's kind of fun to experiment with and to be a part of something new. And at the same time, um, I recognize that uh, technology puts us at a little bit of a disadvantage here because um, it's a lot easier to disengage from the moment. And so if I can offer an encouragement to you um, to to lean in, not physically necessarily, but but in your heart's posture. Um, uh, maybe close your eyes. Uh, we're gonna do some hymns, so they're they're, I think, a little more well-known songs. Um, and maybe maybe sing along, maybe hum along, um, maybe t- spend some moments in prayer. Um, that's that's undivided. Um, you can focus your attention on the Lord in this time. Uh, sing along with us. And sing it as well.
Exit Church, uh, it's good to have you guys uh, back. Thanks for tuning in on our Facebook and YouTube premiere. Um, we are on both platforms, which is kind of exciting. Um, but want uh, more details on that later. We want to give you some updates and some announcements. Uh, first, we started a meal distribution this past week. Huge thank you to the Grant County Rescue Mission for 100% of the food for that. We just provide the fun and the labor and uh, um, so thank you guys so much. We've served over 225 meals and um, we've made some really uh, amazing contacts with people, just meeting new people from the community. So thank you. If you're tuning in from that um, and you heard of us through that, welcome. We're glad to have you. Given our value of being adaptable as a community and what's happening right now uh, in the global context, we're doing a lot more content. And so uh, one of the things that'll be new this week is Jen, our children's minister, uh, the person who runs that for us, and she's a phenomenal storyteller. She was in the middle of telling a series of stories uh, on Nick Vujicic, and she's recorded one today to pick up where she left off. So if you bring your children with you to church or to our worship services, we'd encourage you to, to tune in. Uh, I would encourage you to watch it with them. It's one of those times when you actually get to do that. That's kind of fun. We're also going to be doing uh, devotionals, and it's already begun. Tyler, you should... Yeah, yeah, we started a brand new uh, devotional series. They are video podcasts, vodcasts. Um, I'm calling it a micro podcast, though, because we're, our goal is to keep each episode under five minutes um, for the sake of not just droning on and on, um, but like give you one little bite sized taste and then like enjoy time with the Lord. So the theme of the entire podcast is the names of God. And we've done the first two already. Um, I led those, but our goal long-term is actually to incorporate more faces in with those. And so uh, be prepared. You might start seeing some other faces that you've seen uh, around Exit in the past as we explore more of the names of God. As for the Sunday morning content, which is about to start, uh, we would encourage you to watch it on the biggest screen you have available. So this is a time to, to be very American, if I can say that. <laughs> and... Uh, uh, as a note, so we're going to have it, like Tyler said, on, on both Facebook premiere and YouTube premiere at the same time. And we'll put mm -hmm. links underneath this so that if either one uh, has a malfunction, you can, you can hop over to the other and not miss a beat. Yeah, last week, as some of you experienced on the premiere portion, uh, the video dropped out at about 30 minutes through. And it turns out Facebook's servers were so overloaded in that time that that was actually a pretty normative experience uh, from what I've connected with other churches about. So um, because of that, we are doing yeah, YouTube and Facebook simultaneously. Um, and so feel free to check out the links for those in case this does get bumped. And that's everything we have for you this week. Uh, keep in touch with us, stay tuned, and we'll continue to g give you more updates as we uh, continue to adjust and adapt to whatever is coming at us in this time. Love Thanks, you, church. guys. Love you. Great. Uh, welcome, Exit Church. I'm uh, grateful for this time that we get to be together, even though it's not in person. Uh, I'm also grateful that we live in this time in history, uh, in spite of the sickness that's coming through, that we have the technology available to continue to exegete God's Word and to, to make it public. And uh, as we get started, if you've never been to Exit before, if you've not been a part of our community, typically... We have a book of the Bible, and we work through it just one verse at a time. And the reason we do that is because of our first value. Our first value as a church is the tenacious pursuit of truth. That's the language that we use for that. And it's essentially just us saying that we prioritize truth. We really want to know the truth. We want to know, we want to have a worldview that conforms to reality. And therefore, since God is the singular authority on reality, and he has spoken authoritatively, we make it our regular practice to just dedicate ourselves to the systematic unpacking of God's Word as He's given it to us. Uh, one way to think about this is, I, I used to be a, a bank teller, and one of the jobs of a teller is to be able to catch fraudulent or fake money as it comes through. And the best training you can get to be able to, to recognize fraudulent bills is just to regularly handle the real thing. And so that's what you do. You just handle the real thing a lot. And you can get to the point, if you've been uh, handling money for a while, is you can just be flipping through a stack of bills and all of a sudden you just feel one that feels off. And you just know and you put it to the side. Or you can be flipping through bills and you just see it and know that's not quite right. And so uh, that's 
very typically how we, how we engage with God's Word is we just try to handle the real thing, the real truth of God's Word systematically. That being said, uh, we want you to know that your leadership often asks the question, how should we or when should we pivot and address something that's taking place in the culture, in the world around us? And we almost always decide not to. And it's because we want to give ourselves, a, give a heavy preference to just continuing and sticking with God's word as it's been given and not get off track or distracted. Uh, but the two things that we typically are thinking are, how much does this, whatever's happening in the world around us, whatever the world's talking about, how much does it actually impact our people? That's the first question. And that's different than perceived impact. Uh, the question is, how much does it actually, the, how much does it actually touch the real life of our congregation, of our body. And then the other question we ask is, how much does this matter in terms of our Christian worldview? Is it touching in that space? And the current uh, coronavirus and the current, what's happening in our current you know, affairs in the whole world, uh, it is, it's affecting every single person in our congregation, 100%. And the second thing is that it, it, it even stirs up and draws up questions about God. And so for that reason, this seemed like a, one of the rare fitting times to pivot, and we're just going to spend a couple of weeks between now and Easter handling and engaging with the topic of suffering and affliction and our responses to it. And uh, really, there's, we have two goals in doing this. The first is to have what I would call living theology. There's a difference between uh, what, might be what you might call formal or intellectual or academic theology, Think times when you maybe affirm, yes, I believe that's true, and you state that. There's a difference between that and having the circumstance of your life shift, and the truth is that when the circumstance of your life shift, uh, you will act and live in accordance with whatever, what's happening around you and how you engage with that thing or uh, what you believe to be true underneath, which will inform how you engage with that thing. And that thinking underneath that informs how you live is your living beliefs, right? Your living theology in that sense. And it's possible to have a formal or academic theology that isn't your living theology. You can, we can have good right answers about suffering and affliction, and yet when it comes upon us in our life, the way that we react to it is not in correspondence with what we say we believe. And in that sense, it's not a living theology. It's cut off, which is biblical language from, for death. It's cut off from our actual life. And we want it to be connected, living. We want our, what we believe about God to, uh, to hit our hands. And so we want this to be internalized and personal. And so I realize that even though we just worked through a, a Romans 8, we talked about suffering, now is a time when many of us are walking through these seasons and we have the opportunity to put our hands on it and to, and to grip it and to have that, in that sense, living theology. And that's what we want for us as a body. And the second reason we want to pivot is because we want to equip the church to be the church. Now, it's always been the case in history, in human history, that God's people are commissioned by God to be a sort of intermediaries between the world that doesn't know him, even though they bear his image, and God himself, and that and it's no different now that we are commissioned out to play this intermediary role where we are uh, sent out, in uh, one sense of the word, as, as ministers of reconciliation. And right now is one of those times in human history when present circumstances press down on us things that have always been true but now feel more emergently uh, pressed in or real for us. So, for, for example, it's always been true that we are mortal. And what that means is everybody's going to die. It's pretty dramatic language for that. And that's always been true. And, pr you know, present crisis aside, and even present, it just hasn't changed that fact. But the reality of it is being pressed in, not just on the church, but on the whole world around us. Uh, also, what's always been true, but the reality is getting pressed in, is the fragility of humankind, that we are very fragile as a people. All it takes is one rock from space, one random sickness from a bird. All it takes is, uh, you know, one small, th uh, you know, economic downturn to have everything kind of fall apart and collapse. It only took a few weeks of people saying, hey, you can't go to work for a couple weeks, and then the, you just collapse around us. Uh, and like, in real crisis. And what it reminds us of is a truth that has always been present, 
but sometimes we forget, and that is that we're fragile as a people. And the last one, it's we're mortal, we're fragile. And the third one is, and it's always been true, but present circumstances are pressing it down on us, is that we're not in control. Uh, we've never been in control. Even if we thought that, we've never been in control. And in light of it being the case that we're fragile, those two things combined can be relatively scary. And since all those three combined, that we're fragile, not in control, and then we're mortal, uh, well, all of those old truths, timeless truths being pressed in are causing the world around us to, to lean in and ask questions. And those questions often will be leading people back to the Lord. And now is one of those times in human history when the church has the ability to be very effective in, in the job that we've always had, which is to, to draw people into relationship with God. And so I want us as a people to go into God's Word and be made wise by His Word, so that we can have a living theology and we can live with hope and joy in a context that is otherwise full of anxiety and fear and sorrow, but that we can also reach out to the world around us and uh, be the church. And to do that today, we're going to ask the question, why suffering? And the way that we're going to do that is we're going to go back to the book of Job and we're going to unpack God's word in the book of Job to help us engage with that question and what God's word gives us as answers and hopefully, in, in the doing, we will be pressed into our internal life, that we'll be disciples in that sense, and that we can also be commissioned and equipped to, to go out and be the church that makes disciples. So here we go. Here's Job. We're going to jump in in chapter 1. And uh, we're jumping in on uh, Job's really, really bad day. I, I, the, the, I've underlined, I've added an underline here. So I'm just going to read this to you. It says this in Job 1, verses 13 through 19. Now there was a day when his sons and daughters were eating, his are Job's sons and daughters, he's got 10, were eating and drinking wine at their oldest brother's house. And there came a messenger to Job and said, the oxen were plowing and the donkeys feeding beside them and the Sabians fell upon them and took them and struck down the servants with the edge of the sword and I alone have escaped. So he's lost all of his oxen and his donkeys. And, and then it says this, while he was yet speaking. So he just got the news that all of his oxen and all of his donkeys and all the servants that were attending them are gone. There came another person. So now you've got two people lined up. And his, the second person says, the fire of God fell from heaven and burned up the sheep and the servants and consumed them. And I alone have escaped to tell you. Woof. So now he's lost all of his oxen, all of his donkeys, and now all of his sheep. And he's got two servants left, and they're lined up. And then the very next verse, while he was yet speaking, there came another and said, and I get the third guy lined up, the Chaldeans formed three groups and made a raid on the camels and took them and struck down the servants with the edge of the sword, and I alone have escaped. So that right there, those three servants have just essentially told him that the entire culmination of all of your wealth, and Job was a wealthy guy, is all gone, totally gone. Only thing he has left is his house in terms of physical wealth. Let's see the next, let's see. while he was yet speaking. So now here comes a fourth person, back to back to back to back. Your sons and daughters were eating and drinking wine in their oldest brother's house. And behold, a great wind came across the wilderness and struck the four corners of the house. And it fell upon the young people and they are dead and I alone have escaped to tell you. All right, so he just lost all, all 10 of his children. Now that, that is such a heavy thing to lose all of your children that this is true, the American government won't let you send all of your children to war. They won't draft all of your children at the same time because they actually know that losing all of them is too much. They just know that. And it's actually, in the whole movie Saving Private Ryan is really about this, this idea. And he just lost not only all of his kids, but all of his wealth in the same day, including his house. Now, if we think about what's scary about COVID-19 and the virus, there's, there's two big things. One is... Uh, that it, it could take people that we love. You could argue, well, yeah, it could take me too, but for Christians, that's actually not so bad. But we'll get to that in a minute. But it could take the people I love from me. And that's a heavy thing. And, and it could crush the economy and I could lose my job. And many of us have already started losing our jobs. I have friends that live back in, the, in a major metropolitan area that are already losing their jobs. And, what I, and the threat of that means you could also lose your wealth. What I want you to see is that not just the fear of those things, but the reality of those things all in one day have completely come true in a complete kind of way. I mean that for Job. Now, someone could argue at this point, you could say, yeah, but Job hasn't actually lost his health. Well, let's look at the next day. So Satan went out from the presence of the Lord and struck Job 
with loathsome sores from sole of his foot to the crown of his head. And he took a piece of broken pottery with which to scrape himself while he sat in the ashes. So Job has lost everything, including his health. His whole, his, uh, the only thing he has left is his wife. And what we're going to find here in a moment is that that actually doesn't really work out in his favor. And it's actually a very short section of the book of Job is dedicated to the calamity. And almost the, all of it, the vast majority of it, is dedicated to unpacking the question of why is this happening to Job? And as he starts to ask that question and engage with it, two voices that are not Job's and are not God's yet, two voices really emerge. And the two voices are Job's friends and Job's wife. Now, Job's friends essentially have a unified voice. They have nuanced differences, but the unified voice of Job's friends is that God is just, and therefore you must deserve this. Or one friend actually says, you're probably actually still getting better than you deserve. And that uh, God is just, and the judgment on you is justified. And Job's wife takes the opposite position, that you don't actually deserve this, and that God is not justified in doing it, and therefore, in her actual languages, do you still hold fast to your integrity? Curse God and die. So I want you to see that there's essentially two answers to the question. Either God is justified in the action, or God is not. If God is justified, then you deserve it. And if God is not justified, then he is not good, and therefore you should shake your fist. Close your hand and shake your fist and curse God and die. And this is essentially what the voices that are coming into Job's life are saying to him. And what I'm going to argue is that uh, we're going to see something really similar, even in our modern context, uh, this kind of simplistic thinking. And so let's unpack this uh, each in its turn. So starting with Job's friends. Here's what I want you to see. That there's essentially one set of one thought, which is that God is just and justified in all of his actions. And there's two sides of the coin that comes out. One, if you're a good person, you're going to get good things. And uh, so, for example, uh, God's people will not be harmed by viruses. God's people will not be touched by economic woe. God's people's, God, if you're God's people, your relationships won't fall apart. Your people you love will be protected. Uh, this is kind of like one side of that coin. It's actually funny. I, uh, this week while doing research uh, on this topic to hear what the church was saying about it, how they, what, where in God's word they were going, uh, one, one man named Tim Keller uh, points this out, and it's about five years ago, and he said, uh, be careful, and he used this, the example of Psalm 91. He said, be careful in your exegesis of texts like this, and he used Psalm 91, and Psalm 91 has, as a part of it, it says this. I'll read this to you. For he will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. On their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against a stone. And what, the way that Tim Keller reads that in like layman's language is essentially if you're a godly person, God won't even let you stub your toe. And what ends up happening is in the desert, Satan actually comes and quotes this exact text to, to Jesus and says, hey, jump off the highest spot of the tower and uh, God will protect you because on their hands they will bear you up lest you strike your foot against a stone. If, you know, bad things won't happen to good people. And he points out, he says, you know, one good cue that you're executing a text wrong is if it's the exact way the devil does it. Uh, and he points, out, uh, he, he points out later in the text how Jesus says things like, you know, a day is coming if, because you're my disciples that people will drag you into the street and they'll even kill you and they'll beat you and even kill you. He says, but don't worry, not even a hair of your head will, be, will perish. And so clearly Jesus is taking a longer view of history. Uh, and so, so should we. But an overly simplistic view of the text will tell us that no bad thing will happen to people that are God's. And why I tell you that is I was looking at recent history. Now, that sermon was five years old. And I was looking at people preaching in the last couple of weeks. And do you know where they're going? Psalm 91, exact same psalm. You know what they're reading? I'm just going to read you two verses before that. Because you have made the Lord your dwelling place, the Most High, who is my refuge, no evil shall be allowed to befall you. No plague come near your tent. They say, look at this. No plague come near your tent if you're God's people. Again, the very next verse. For he will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. On their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against a stone. And they say, look, the reason Christians get sick is because they don't know God's promises. This is almost an exact quote I was hearing. And so what are they saying? Good things for good people. Now, they're obviously getting it wrong because good people, Christian people get sick all the time, not the least of which is Job, which we're going to talk about here in a second. But the other side of that co coin that comes out of the exact same kind of thinking, and I want you to notice that, is bad things for bad people. And so you're also going to find presently, immediately, and even at other times in the past, 
that when there's a disaster or a plague of some kind, that some TV preacher will come on and say, this is God's judgment. And they'll just pick their pet sin that they don't like, and they'll say, God's judging us for this. And it's the other side of the same kind of thinking. Good things for good people, bad things for bad people. So let's look, let's now, now that we kind of have the picture of Job's friends thinking, let's go back to the text in Job and see what God says. He says this. This is late in Job where God shows up again and starts speaking. And he's actually just given Job a pretty tough talk, pretty tough speech, where he kind of puts Job back, back in his place. And we'll talk more about that a bit next week when we talk about our responses to suffering. But for now, I want you to see what he says here about Job's friends. He says, After the Lord had spoken to these words to Job, the Lord said to Eliphaz, who's the first of the friends, the Temanite, My anger burns against you and against your two friends, for you have not spoken of me what is right, as my servant Job has. He says overtly, the friends were wrong. The friends were wrong. And if you're a reader of the book of Job and you're paying close attention, we actually already knew that because we have God's perspective in the story and we remember Job 1 where it says this, And the Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job, that there is none like him in all the earth, a blameless and upright man who fears God and turns away from evil? Here's a direct quote from God saying that Job is an upright, blameless man who fears God and turns away from evil. Now we have a blameless, upright man who turns away from evil who loses all of his possessions and his children and his health in a very short amount of time. Good person, bad things. So Job's friends were wrong. Uh, although that idea has, uh, in my opinion, as, uh, as I'm arguing here, has been made clear in Old Testament Scripture, it still lives on into New Testament Scripture, into the life of Jesus. And so I want you to see in Jesus' life and ministry, him engaging with the same kinds of thoughts and how he engages with them. And it looks like this. This is from Luke 13. I'm going to give us two examples. Here's one. There were some present at that very time who told him about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. And he answered them, this is Jesus speaking. Do you think that these Galileans were worse sinners than all the other Galileans because they suffered in this way? Now pause for a second. If you are a student of Scripture, then you know that Jesus is able to actually know what people are thinking, and he will often know what they're thinking and d engage them directly about it. And so here, what's rhetorical, we understand as a reader, is true, that they are thinking that. And Jesus answers, he says, No, I tell you, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Or those 18 on whom the tower in Siloam fell and killed them, do you think that they were worse offenders than all the others who lived in Jerusalem? No, I tell you, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Here's what, there's a couple of things that are being pointed out here by Jesus. First of all, if what we say when there's plague or disaster is that God's judging those people, then what we also have to say is that when things are going well for people, that God is affirming their behaviors as good and that they're upright and righteous. But we don't actually accept that. In fact, what we would say is that everybody is needing of the righteousness of God. And so what Jesus says is you shouldn't presume that the counter was true. Therefore, you shouldn't presume that that's true. You don't know that. But what you should do is leverage this moment as an opportunity to remember what's true about everybody. That we are all mortal and that we're all going to die and stand before God. And therefore, remember that and repent now while you've got a chance. It, it almost... Uh, smacks of Ecclesiastes when the author of Ecclesiastes writes that it's better to be in the house of mourning and sadness than the house of merriment. And I'm paraphrasing. Because death is the destiny of all men and it's good for the living to take that to heart. So Jesus says, look, you, you, can't, you don't really know that, but what you do know is that you're going to stand before God one day. And so you need to repent while you have a chance. Leverage this as an opportunity to remember your own mortality and to respond in kind. Let's see him do one more, engage with one more time. The same thinking comes up. This is from John chapter 9. As he, being Jesus, passed by, he saw a man blind from birth. And his disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? And Jesus answered, It was not that this man sinned or his parents, but that the works of God might be displayed in him. He denies the presupposition. It doesn't necessarily mean that it's, it's a direct result of someone's sin. That's not the necess necessarily the cause. And so he presses back and he says, this actually has a different reason for being. And the reason is for the ultimate glory of God, that God's works might be displayed in him. So the text clearly pushes against this idea. Now, we don't need any more than this, but I want to give us a crystallized view of the logic that's wrong and how Jesus is correcting it and kind of put it out for us so we can see it. 
we have a name for this. It's a logical fallacy that, we would, that is called affirming the consequent. And it looks like this. If A is true, then B. A causes B. And then we say B is true, therefore A must be true. Uh, you maybe have heard this saying, if there's smoke, there's fire, right? Smoke comes from, fire causes smoke. If smoke is there, fire is present. Right? This, is, this is the kind of thinking. So let me give you a few examples. And all of my illustrations are morbid, so I'm just going to keep with that. I'm about to be a parent, so uh, I'm going to use one of the children that I know lots of parents think. Here's, here's what it looks like in another context, that same kind of thinking. If the child is in a coma, they won't call home. Child is not called home, therefore child is in a coma. Okay, so if A, then B, it's true that if your child is in a coma, they won't call home. That's true. A causes B. It's also true that the child has not called home. And since B, therefore A. So that's the kind of logic. Now we see it here, we think that's silly. Of course that's wrong. And the reason is because there's all kinds of reasons why your kid maybe didn't call home. They could just be lazy, their phone could break, they could forget, you know, who knows. Uh, but now let's see what it looks like actually on the ground right now. God uses plague or disaster as judgment. That's true. Now I want to pause for a second. What we should know about God is that God always acts within the constraints of his own character. Or another way of saying that is that God always acts in alignment with his character. So if we see that God does something in Scripture, what we have to say is that it's within his character to do so. So that's true. God does sometimes use plagues and disasters as judgment. Uh, think about Sodom and Gomorrah. Think about Noah and the flood. I mean, there's lots, actually, of examples in the text of this. The end of 2 Samuel, the people of Israel, and the plague he sends because of the sins of David. Okay, uh, point two, we are experiencing plague or disaster. That's, that's true right now. And then we say, therefore, God is judging us. So A leads to B, A being our own sin, leading to plagues and disasters as judgment. We are experiencing B, plagues and disasters, therefore God is judging us. This is the logic that's, on, that's happening. But the truth is that when we look at the broad strokes of Scripture, reality is a lot more complicated than a simple A, a leads to B. It looks more, or I should actually pause. Uh, the pendulum swing of this thinking that often comes up, when we have this, and we, the church will often pendulum swing and say, no, it's just not true. Uh, God isn't like that. He doesn't judge us. He just loves us. Now, that's also wrong. God does judge us. What we've said is that God does always act within the confines of his character and that God does sometimes do that. Uh, but the reality of the situation and why this kind of logic isn't true is that, and I'll show you a picture here of what the reality really looks like. Lots of things lead to B. A can lead to B, yes. Our own sin can, mean that, and can lead to God's judgment, which is A, can lead to plagues and disasters. But it can also be C or D or E or F or G or H or I. Lots of things can lead to plague or disasters or suffering and afflictions if we're going to be more general. And if you want, you can go back just one, uh, a few weeks. We were doing Romans 8. I believe it begins in verse 18. And I went through all of these. Now, this is just my list, and it's a short and incomplete list, and I realized that. But these are all the different places and the ways in which I found it very quickly in my cursory look through Scripture of times that we see suffering and affliction come, come on God's people. And the different causes of it. B being suffering and affliction. And sometimes, yes, judgment is one of those things. You can see that still in that A slot. But also, sometimes you just love someone, and that leads to suffering for us. Because when you love loving people, either they can wrong you or they can die. And, uh, or you can be a victim of someone else's sin. God could be leveraging something in your suffering and affliction to sanctify you for your best interest. It can be self-inflicted. You know, all these reasons. And, and I want to press a little bit further and say this. God is huge and incredibly brilliant. And especially when we look at something with the scope of the coronavirus that's taking place now, what we should probably presume is that God is doing more than one at a time, and he's able to do this. Think about just the letter, just, just Job, right? Uh, one, from the enemy. We know that that's true. It's actually the devil doing these things. We also see that, these are, that, the, that the cause of this is actually hidden from Job. So now it's actually two of the things on our list. He is suffering because he loved his children. That's loving someone, the cost of loving someone. That's now a third. And, and what we also learn by the end of the letter is that Job is himself being sanctified. Because by the time you get to the end of the letter, something in Job has been revealed that he actually would call God into question. Because all of us, by the way, act within the confines of our character. And that the circumstance kicked up out of Job something that he didn't even know was lacking in himself. He was willing to call God out and say, you have to come and answer for this. 
and it revealed something to Job about himself. And through the end of that season, he comes out wiser, more knowledgeable about God, and his character is actually shaped even more. And so now already we're seeing four things just in the letter of Job, in the book of Job. And so the point is that we don't always know why. We very rarely actually will know why suffering comes. And so there's two things I want you to take when we talked about in the front end, uh, internal life, that we should be careful about diagnosing the why of our own suffering. Now, don't get me wrong. If you can put a finger on sin in your life, you should certainly repent. But the reason why I'm reluctant to be like, to, to say, yeah, you should just diagnose that as the cause is you shouldn't need disaster to know to repent. We have God's word. And so, yeah, repent, sure, but, there, but we should be slow to diagnose this is happening because, whether it's in our own life or in the world around us and our neighbors and friends. And when somebody asks us, and we get this all the time, you know, hey, I heard this preacher say that this is because of God's judgment. I want us to be made wise by God's word to be able to speak into that and say, you know, God's word actually has a more complex picture of suffering than that. And so let's pause and let's give a well thought through answer from God's word to a well thought through and really, like, you know, ruminating question. And let's not give an overly simplic- simplistic answer to that. But what about Job's wife? So there's that other, other voice that says, no, no, God is not justified in doing this, that he is wrong and that we should shake our fist at that. And, uh, and I want you to know, this is a question that our culture also asks. They look at the suffering around the world, they look at what takes place, and they, they call God's integrity into question. And I want to actually show you a quote. Uh, first, it's from Job. Uh, and I want to point this out. Satan answered the Lord, uh, this is early in Job, and says, Does Job fear God for no reason? Have you not put a hedge around him and his house and all that he has on every side? You have blessed the work of his hands, and his possessions have increased in the land. But stretch out your hand and touch all that he has, and he will curse you to your face. So what is Satan's hypothesis about Job? God comes and says, Have you considered my servant Job, who's fear, who fears God and is blameless and upright, And Satan says, he doesn't love you for you. He loves you for your stuff, the things that he gets. He loves you because of his circumstances. Take away the good circumstances and he'll curse you to your face. And that's what Satan's kind of hoping for, right? Then God says, all right, fine. Take away the stuff. Let's see. Let's see. He does. And then what does Job's wife say? Curse God and die. Now, what is Satan hoping for? Take away the stuff and he'll curse you to his face. What is his wife's advice? Curse God. Job's wife's advice is Satan's hope. For Job. I want you to see that. I want you to see that Job's wife's advice is the devil's hope. And we look at our own circumstance and suffering. We still have the same enemy. And the hope of our enemy is that in the midst of bad circumstances that we will curse God and in so doing prove that our worship and affections for God were actually not based on God but on the things he gives us. And in case you don't think that that's still true, that we're still not looking at circumstances, looking at the things God does and cursing him, I want you to see what the world says. I want to show you this quote. This is from Richard Dawkins. It says, The God of the Old Testament is arguably the most unpleasant character in all fiction. Jealous and proud of it. A petty, unjust, unforgiving, control freak, a vindictive, bloodthirsty, ethnic cleanser, a misogynistic, homophobic, racist, infanticidal, genocidal, philicidal, pestilential, megalomaniac, maniacal, maniacal, sadomasochistic, capricious, malevolent bully. So that's cursing God, right? That's exactly what it looks like to look at what happens in terms of unpleasant circumstances and then turn and curse God. And uh, since death is the destiny of all men and then die, which is a rather unpleasant way to end and see your maker with those words on your lips. So, what is the medicine to help us not land where the devil hopes? And I'm going to give us three things. And all of them are going to be ruminating on God. uh, Some way of that. And the first one is ruminating on God's love. And specifically, God's love for us. And this is the first thing to protect us and guard our hearts from closing our fist and shaking it at God. And the few pieces of God's love that I really want you to see. 
And the first is that for God so loved the world that he sent his only son. The first is that God's love is one that gets off the throne and participates in creation that he made and that he even made it good. And we have put upon creation all of these evil and painful things and all the negative, all the suffering that comes out of the creation, by the way, is all the consequence of our own rebellion against God. And he chooses not just to subject himself to being a part of creation, but a part of the brokenness of creation, that he subjects himself to suffering. And he subjects himself to being, you know, all the different kinds of, of, of suffering that we engage with, uh, Jesus engages with, except for self-inflicted uh, from his own sin. He doesn't actually sin. But he actually takes upon himself, as a note, our sin, and still bears the weight of that kind of suffering. And that takes us to the second kind of, the d- second dynamic of God's suffering. Not only do we have a, suff- a God who loves us so much that he participates with us, but he has, we have a God who loves us so much that he would die for us, that he would actually suffer and die. And that is the culminating act of God's love, in fact. Uh, in John 15, Jesus says, greater love has no one than this, that he laid down his life for his friends. Or in Romans 5, it says that this is, God demonstrates his love for us and this and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Or 1 John 3.16 says that this is how we know what love is, that Jesus Christ laid his life down for us. And so we have a God who loves us so much so that he would participate in the suffering with us, for one, and that he would actually die to purchase us. And that God's, God's love for us is profound and deep. And when we get, if we can just start there, it'll really guard our hearts from closing our fist. And then the second part of this that's good to ruminate on, uh, in addition to God's affections, is God's power. That God is able. That he is able. That he is not uh, impotent or unable to, 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 to speak into every kind of negative circumstance and ultimately bring it about for good. Uh, that God and Jesus says this a few, in a few different ways. He knows every hair on your head, that every bird that falls from the sky, he actually knows. And we read last, last couple of weeks about God's sovereignty and that God works all things according to the purpose of his will and therefore that we can be confident that God is able. And so the circumstances of our life are not because God has somehow lost the wheel of history and that we are out of control. But not only does God love us, but he is able and sovereign and He is the one that we can run to in those moments to be our help. And if he is our help, he won't be our enemy, our curse. And the third, so we've got God's love, God's power. And the third is God's plan. That God has a plan that he is is going to bring about, uh, regardless of immediate circumstances, how things might feel, that God ultimately has an unstoppable plan because of God's power. And that because of his love, that plan is actually going to be good. It, and this is where we're going to get texts like Romans 8. And I'm so glad we just worked through this. That the God who loves us, it says this, that, uh, for, uh, that God works together all things for good for those who love him and are called according to his purposes. And, it's, and, it's, and then he culminates later with, therefore, who can separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus? Not height, not depth, not present, not future, no nothing in all creation. Not angels or demons. And so then we see the combination of God's affections for us and his power working together to ensure us that no matter, no matter what happens, that God has the ability to work all of that together for ultimately for good. And his good plan for us is to be formed in our character to look like his son, Jesus so that on the other side of eternity we'll be among and amidst, in the midst of God's people, all of whom who have been shaped, even through suffering, to look like the character of Jesus, so that we live in a society f- that is beautiful, and then, and then in that space we see God protecting us from harm, cutting off death itself, and wiping every tear from our eye. And that is God's plan for eternity. And God has the ability to carry it out because of his power and that we are the subjects of that good future because of his love for us. And when we spend our time ruminating on those three things, we have, a good, we have good medicine for hard times, even when we don't know the answers to the real reasons why. And really, when we ruminate on those things, it actually builds us up into maturity. I, I, one of the things I heard this week that I think is beautiful, we'll talk a lot more about this next week, 
is this idea of maturity. One of the dynamics of this is being able to love God. I think the language they used was with the lights off. And the illustration they gave, if you're interested in this, you can go look it up. It's Alistair Begg, Loving God with the Lights Off. And he says, you know, when you're a little child, you're parenting a little child, uh, at first they might ask that you leave the lights on while they sleep because they want to be able to see what's around them in order to feel safe and good. And at first you might say, okay, I'll leave the lights on. But eventually you say, no, I'm going to turn the lights off now. You say, well, can you at least leave the light on in the hallway? You say, okay, I'll do that. Well, then you go to shut the door and, you know, the next week, and they say, can you leave the door open? And you might say yes at first, but then eventually, uh, you know, you, you, you leave it just cracked, and you just crack it, and eventually you finally close it. And he said, you know, it's fine, it's cute when you're really young, but some of us have been pursuing the Lord for, for you know, decades and decades, and we still aren't willing to turn the lights out, and we aren't willing to love God in the dark. We have to know what's going on in order to know that he's good. And, of course, that's a hard th thing to hear, but he has this really neat accent, which makes it easy for him to say it. Uh, but I'd encourage you to go listen to that. And what we do know is the ultimate destination of God's plan. And so part of being mature is being able to ruminate on these things and who God is, his power, his love, his plan. And to say, you know, I don't know what's happening right now. I don't know the exact why, but I do know that God's going to work it for his purposes in my life. I know that his purposes are good because he's already demonstrated his love for me and he is able. So in closing, let me give you just a few, uh, a few bits of application for us to be thinking about that's, that I'm hoping are timely for us. And the first is to take advantage of the opportunity to reset the rhythm of your life. I, I felt for a long time that uh, Jesus gives the parable of the sower and the seeds, and he says that the seed that falls among thorns is the seed that, that is the people who hear God's word and they understand it even has roots in that sense. But the worries of day-to-day -day life and the deceitfulness of wealth choke it out and make it unfruitful. And I think if we're being honest, if we ask, you know, why don't we read more? Why don't we pray more? Why don't we do these things that kind of recenter our life on e things that are eternal and most important? The answer we often give is, I'm just so busy. You know, I'm just so busy. Ah, oh, man, I really want to do that, but I'm so busy. And here what we have is a time, in, a rare time, in terms of our life, unprecedented, when all of everything is just stopping. Unless you're a doctor or a nurse or a teller or a grocer, uh, life is just stopping right now. And you, the, re the whole life is just, the whole rhythm is resetting. And I would just I want to encourage us as a people to take advantage of the reset, to intentionally plug in things into that rhythm of our life that, that push us into healthier spaces spiritually, to take time to read God's word, just you and the Lord and your word. Maybe with a family, that could be a really beautiful time. To take time in prayer uh, in the Lord to just reach out to him and to, to ruminate on him. And as another part of this, taking advantage and being intentional with the time, I would also encourage us to be careful about the content that we take in. Uh, it's really easy to, really, to just saturate right now in the trauma of what's taking place in the, in the news is depiction and every, you know, every few hours is an update. This is how many new cases we're seeing with coronavirus. This is what's happening in the, in the stock market and the economy. And I'll confess that I'm also keeping up on that. I'm not telling you to be ignorant of those things. But I would just say to, to guard the amount of content you're taking in that is in that space and to counterbalance it with an even higher portion of, of good quality content, God's word, worship, prayer. Because what can happen is we can bury ourselves almost like blinders into the trauma of what's happening, and we become traumatized people, and we lose the scope of eternity. And so I want for, to, uh, for us to be people who don't lose scope, who don't lose God's perspective. We can take the long view, and therefore we cannot be drowned out. We can retain our joy and our hope in hard times. We can be internally, we can have living theology, and another part of this is to be think creative about how to use your time to reach out to the people that you love and that you know love you, to your neighbors around you that are also questioning. And if you've done the first half of this, I'm hoping that they'll get to see you and, and see how you're engaging in this unique time in history and start asking you these questions. What's going on? What is God doing? Is this God's judgment? And you can point them to the gospel and talk about a God who really does judge and whose justice demands an answer in the God who answers his own justice by paying our own debt. You can even take him into Romans 3 if you like.
321-26. The second half of this challenge I want to do say is a part of that first one, which is just to guard your heart with the Lord, to, to engage with God's word, to, to play worship music. Uh, one of the activities I think would be really neat if you're really feeling overwhelmed and burdened is to just list the things in your life that you're grateful for. Because God is the giver of all good gifts. Uh, on the first leg of, of, of Job's trial, when Job's wife comes and gives him that, that temptation, really, which is, from, which is in line with what the devil wants, curse God and die, Job's response is, should we take the evil and the good and not the evil? Because if God is sovereign over the bad things, isn't he sovereign over the good things? So do we worship God when things are good and then ignore him when things, and then shake our fist and run our way when things are bad? And so the truth is that life is almost always a mixed bag and that there's almost always things to be grateful for and always things to, to, to be worried about and concerned about, should we choose to. And so in a time when we are constantly being t drawn into the worrying and the anxiety and the fear, to double back and spend time listing what we're grateful for and our affections for him. I'd love to be available to you this, the, during this week. Feel free to email me or reach out. I'll pray for us, and we'll do some worship together. Love you, Exit Church. Father, uh, we thank you that you are the giver of all good gifts. Lord, we thank you that you have set your affections on us and that you have ignited our affections for you. And we, Lord, we ask that during this time that you would actually breathe on us and stoke up the flames that our affections for you would get, just get more intense that we would, Father, be your church at this time, that we'd be gripped by your love and your power and your plan for us, and that we'd be unshaken by, by circumstances that are, that are difficult, but, Lord, that we would also be used by you to love the world around us that bears your image but doesn't know you. Lord, that you would use us to be able to tell people the good news, that we could be almost contagious of hope and contagious of joy, that your church would spread, that it would, it would explode and overtake as we see it can, other things can so easily, though, that you, the, the knowledge of you, your gospel, and affections for you would have an even greater response than the physical body does to these kinds of viruses. So Lord, we love you so much, and we thank you that you've given us your word, that you've told us your plan, that you've set your affections on us, and we're looking forward to eternity. Thank you for the cross, Lord Jesus. We love you. Amen. God bless you, Exit Church. Find a 
Yeah. Hey.